So the project that I'll be talking about today um, is one that was established in the late 90s by a uh, forest ecologist with DNR, Richard Bigley. Uh, when Richard retired this past December, um, I inherited this project. Um, and this sort of, uh, you'll hear some of the same themes that you heard in Dan's talk. Um, the major difference being here that we're talking about thinning younger stands than the ones that Dan was showing, which were probably 30 or 40 years old, at least. Okay, so let me set the stage a little bit. As a lot of you probably know, um, the rate of harvest in this part of the peninsula peaked uh, in the 60, through the 60s into the 80s. And as a result of that, there was this really large cohort of young, relatively uniform forest stands. Um, and by the 90s, uh, over a quarter of the OESF forests were less than 20 years old. Uh, so also in that era, there were a number of studies looking at ways alternative uh, harvest practices um, instead of just large regeneration harvests, looking at um, creating gaps and also using commercial thinning to uh, diversify the forest structure and create different types of habitat. <clears throat> uh, and so before I go any further, I'm just gonna make a couple generalizations about thinning. Uh, the basic idea behind thinning a forest stand uh, is to take a young, young or maybe middle-aged stand where the trees are all um, locked into competition with one another and to basically choose the winners and losers among those trees. So if uh, you, oops. All right, so if you take a young stand and uh, you don't thin it, uh, these trees will continue to compete with one another for decades to come and all the growth that occurs in that stand will be distributed among all these different trees. Um, if you thin this stand over the next couple of decades, that growth is um, confined to the, basically the winners that you've already selected. And I'll mention commercial and pre-commercial thinning. The only differences or the distinction there is pre-commercial thinning is when the trees are still, the trees that you cut are still small enough that there's no market for them. So instead they're just left uh, on the forest floor to decompose. Whereas of course commercial thinning, um, the trees are large enough to sell. So the study was, I believe, originally titled, titled Thinning for Biodiversity. Um, like I said, it was started by Richard Bigley and colleagues in cooperation with uh, DNR's Olympic region. Their goal was to test how pre-commercial thinning or thinning of young stands could be used to influence future stand structures, uh, habitat quality, plant communities, and forest products. I'll be working on a report summarizing everything from this project uh, to date. I'll be working on that this year. And today I'm just showing some early results uh, from the data I've been looking at. So this project was uh, established, here's Forks, um, on five different sites uh, south of Forks. And a quick timeline, these stands were all harvested in uh, the mid-70s, planted uh, by 1980, primarily planted with Douglas fir, a few Sitka spruce. Um, these study treatments that I'll be talking about, the thinning treatments were done in uh, around 1998, and these were measured several times since then. And if you go out to these stands today, you can still see um, signs of this pre-commercial thinning about tw that took place about 20 years ago. Um, you'll see a lot of small stumps decomposing. You can still see some of these small trees um, decomposing on the forest floor. Uh, so this study had five different treatments, and these same treatments were replicated at each of the five sites, and all the treatments were based on specific management objectives. So we have this control treatment where nothing was done, no thinning at all was done. Uh, then we have uh, sort of a standard pre-commercial thin. Goal was wood production. Uh, they thinned to a pretty typical rate of uh, left 300 trees per acre standing. And whenever there was Douglas fir, they, they chose that in the trees to, to leave. Um, then the, there's these three sort of alternative thinning treatments. Uh, that were tested, and one of these is this um, wide thin treatment. The goal here is wood production, getting larger diameter trees, more probably more wind firm, more stable trees. So they only left 200 trees per acre here, and again favored Douglas fir, um, left Douglas fir when possible. We have this thin plus gaps treatment. Uh, the goal was wood production combined with um, habitat enhancement. So 300 trees were left, but in this case, they tried to diversify the species in the forest canopy by leaving 40% uh, non-Douglas fir. And so there was a whole 
basically any other tree species that they could leave besides Douglas fir the left here. And additionally, um, added 30 and 60 foot gaps. And the gaps were left in this type of pattern. And you can see here, 10 years after they were cut, you can still see in the aerial photo what these gaps look like. And these are, these are smaller gaps than the ones Dan was talking about. So a 30 foot wide gap is 1 60th of an acre and a 60 foot wide gap is 1 15th of an acre. So that's just on the small end of, of what Dan was um, describing. Uh, so then my favorite term here, aggressive habitat enhancement. Uh, this is a, a, a wide thinning down to 200 trees per acre. Um, again, looking for non-dug fir and again, putting these gaps in. All right, so I'm going to show now some photos of just to give you a visual sense of how these different treatments developed over time, and then I'll have a few graphs after that. So this is our control treatment. No thinning was done. Um, you can see here that you know these trees are all, you know, they're growing a little bit, but they're still extremely dense. Um, and this is after 16 years. So the data I'll be talking about today is 16-year data. Um, yeah, just a really dense forest stand here. Um, one thing these photos will be highlighting is what's going on in the understory. So the goal with this enhancing habitat was to try to get some understory vegetation for uh, wildlife, for forage, for, for browse. Um, and so you can see here, if you don't thin, this is in that competitive exclusion stage of stand development. All the trees are, are just really competing hard for the sunlight. There's virtually, uh, you know, there's almost no sunlight reaching the forest floor directly, and so you have almost no vegetation there. All right, so here's our standard thin treatment. This is a pretty typical pre-commercial thin that left 300 trees per acre. Um, by 16 years after treatment, uh, you've got some, the trees are developing pretty nicely, but again, they've, they've filled in that canopy. Um, so you have very little light reaching the forest floor. We have some moss here. We have, I think, one fern and one trillium in the understory. Um, and looking at another site, it's kind of the same story. Uh, 16 years after this treatment, uh, pretty dense forest uh, canopy and very little in the understory. So now moving on to some of these alternative uh, pre-commercial uh, thinning treatments. This is our wide thin where we get down to 200 trees per acre. Uh, after 16 years, you can see that uh, there's still, even though these trees have been filling in the canopy over 16 years, uh, there's still enough light reaching the understory to sustain at least a little bit of understory vegetation here 16 years later. And the trees are in this treatment are even larger diameter than in the 300 trees per acre. Um, so here's another site, same treatment. Um, you can see a, f a little bit of understory here, still after 16 years, and definitely some larger diameter trees. So here's a treatment where we combined these small gaps with thinning. Um, thin to 300 trees per acre, and this is actually standing right in the middle of a 30-foot gap. But you can barely tell it's a gap because the trees uh, adjacent to this gap, have, have, their branches have reached out and they've basically closed over. And even in this 30-foot gap, there's very little sunlight reaching the forest floor, not enough to really sustain any kind of understory. Um, <clears throat> but it's a totally different picture in the 60-foot uh, gap. So again, same treatment, but just one of the large gaps instead of one, instead of, one of the small ones. Uh, here we have this pretty vigorous understory uh, vegetation growing. Even after 16 years, the trees have not filled in that gap. Um, there's not, these gaps are smaller than the ones Dan was talking about where we had a lot of dense regeneration. Uh, we really don't see, don't see too much here in terms of regeneration within the gaps, maybe a few saplings. Um, but that's largely because these gaps are smaller than, than the ones he was talking about. Here's another site, same treatment, a 60-foot gap. Um, you can see a pretty good variety of understory in this gap. After 16 years, um, there's some shrubs. We have some uh, elderberry and some other things growing here. So this is our aggressive habitat enhancement treatment. Uh, the wide, wide thinning down to 200 trees per acre. Um, and this is a 30-foot gap. So in contrast to that last 30-foot gap I showed you, there's actually a little bit of vegetation growing here still. And that's because the trees around the gap are less dense. So the overstory is less dense around the gap. Um, and then the most uh, extreme situation, here's where we have the fewest trees left from our pre-commercial thinning. Uh, this is that wide, widely spaced thinning, and then this is a 60-foot gap. So you see really a, a, a pretty big uh, difference here in terms of what the understory looks like. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to move on. Uh, well, OK, so this is just showing the gaps again. If you point the camera upward, what you see after 11 and 16 years, uh, things by 16, these 30 foot gaps are, are pretty well filled in. Not much legacy there, but the 60 foot gap was big enough uh, to leave a hole where you get some direct sunlight still. All right, so I'm going to show a few graphs now to illustrate some things that weren't really visible in the photos. Uh, this is just the height distribution of different species after 16 years. So on this horizontal axis, we have a number of trees per acre, and here we have the height. So what we're looking at is like a frequency distribution of the different species, how many of these different species there are. Of course, you got the most here in the unthinned treatment. A few things I want to point out. In general, the Douglas fir are, are still among the tallest trees in each of these treatments, taller than the hemlock. The overstory in these stands is all pretty much dug fir and hemlock. Uh, so in these two treatments, remember the, the thin plus gaps and wide thin plus gaps, they tried to leave 40% non dug fir to get a more diverse overstory. Well, from what I've seen so far, that, that didn't really work out too well because basically you have dug fir and hemlock dominating the overstory in any case. Uh, and where they tried to presumably leave some other species besides these two, they just didn't really last. You have dug fir and hemlock competing most strongly on these sites. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out, in these three alternative uh, pre-commercial thinning treatments, this one, this one, and this one, you do have enough light to allow this uh, sort of younger cohort of hemlock to start to, to develop, to get up to 20, 30 feet tall in, in these treatments. So looking at diameter growth of these trees over time, this is years since treatment going out to uh, 16 years, and QMD is just another way of calculating diameter, average diameter of trees in, this, in these treatments. Uh, you can see that with our standard pre-commercial thinning to 300 trees per acre, um, there was, uh, if you look really closely, you can see that the growth increase was more rapid early on and here is starting to level off, um, where you left fewer trees per acre, each tree had more room to grow. Uh, these two orangish lines represent the uh, wide thinning. Um, and so those, those obviously um, increased in diameter more. They're not really, the growth rate there is not really tapering off like it is with, at the 300 trees per acre. They still have a little bit more room to grow even after 16 years. Um, and the gaps really didn't, as far as diameter growth goes, gaps didn't really make a difference at all. Uh, and both of these are, of course, uh, much superior to the unthin treatment. Okay, so looking at the distribution of diameters, in this graph, um, just got this full range of diameters of trees that you'll find in the overstory at these sites, and the frequency here in terms of trees per acre in each of these diameter classes. Uh, and so it's, it makes a pretty, uh, pretty uh, smooth sort of transition here. The more trees you remove, um, this light blue line here, now at 16 years later, we have 280 trees per acre. You know, you're getting an average diameter maybe around 13, 14 inches. Um, but then the fewer trees you leave, the bigger the average diameter. Um, and you also have this sort of broad base of, of diameter distribution. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if we look just at the largest trees in these stands, if you want these really large, uh, presumably uh, wind firm, large diameter trees. Uh, looking at 14 inch plus trees, uh, largest tree or the largest number of those trees, this is in trees per acre, is in these wide thinning treatments. Um, 16 inch plus trees, again, you have most trees in those wide thin treatments. So I'll talk just for a second about what the crowns of these trees uh, look like. Uh, these dug fir and hemlock are, are pretty responsive to light. This is just an example, kind of like some that Dan showed where you have uh, a tree on the edge of a gap. So you've got light on this side and you've got the forest matrix on this side. And you can see this tree doesn't even bother to hold on to its branches on the forest side, but instead these branches on the gap side reaching way, way out. Uh, so there's something, one metric that we use to, to quantify the crowns is uh, like live crown ratio or percent live crown. Uh, so if you have a 100-foot tall tree and the top 40 feet has a green crown, then you have like a 40% live crown uh, in that tree. And so this, this graph is actually quite, in, in terms of the shape, it's quite similar to that last graph I showed with the diameter distributions. Um, here you have in the, the not thinned, unthinned control treatment, you have this sort of shape. And then as you remove more trees, you each, the trees all have uh, longer live crowns. 
um, getting to the most extreme case where we, there was, I think, 170 trees left per acre in this wide, thin, plus gaps. Here, you've, you've really got some crowns going almost all the way got down to the ground. You've got like 80 and 90% of those trees, uh, 80 or 90% crown on some of those trees. So crowns reaching almost down to the ground, um, which there's some benefits of having a longer crown. Uh, that's basically where your diameter growth comes from. Uh, if you have more branches, that's correlated with the root system. So a lar larger crown is usually a more wind firm tree. But of course the negative is when you have branches persisting all the way down to the ground, that's gonna affect the wood quality on those trees. Uh, so it's kind of a trade off there. Uh, so just uh, talking about what worked in this project, um, you know, basically uh, if you have this competitive exclusion phase in these young stands where their trees are trying to take all the light and if you wanna diversify the uh, habitat, diversify the forest structure during that early development stage of these stands. Um, wide thinning uh, looked like it could probably achieve that goal. You got some understory there even after 16 years. The 60 foot gaps were large enough, those 1 16th acre gaps were large enough that you still had some understory going on. Um, and also you, uh, we found you could definitely achieve some larger diameter and potentially more wind firm trees. Um, uh, with these pre-commercial treatments. There are a few caveats. Uh, these were pre-commercially thinned at about 20 years of age. That's older than you would normally do a pre-commercial thinning. You probably normally want to do it by like 10 years of age um, when the trees are about 15 feet tall. Uh, and so results may differ based on that. The reason these were thinned later is just because uh, in the 1990s there's such a, a backlog of thinning needing to be done due to all the large number of young stands. Uh, so they didn't get to them until about age 20. Um, we found that the, trying to manipulate the, the tree species composition of the overstory was not really effective because dug fir and hemlock are what's, they're what's going to grow best there. And so they're going to outcompete whatever other trees you tried to put into that overstory during the thinning. Um, there was some bear damage. I didn't show that here, but in that extreme treatment where you left the fewest trees, where you put in gaps plus only 200 trees per acre. Um, there was definitely higher bear damage there, and that's something I will be uh, analyzing as part of the report I'm working on later this year on this project. And finally, the cost. This is pre-commercial thinning, and so it does not pay for itself, and um, cost is always a limiting factor, and this is not something you could afford to do everywhere. So potentially, you could target specific areas, um, but that, of course, is one limiting factor. And finally, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, funding was provided initially for the establishment of this project by the National Biological Survey. Um, Olympic Region staff were instrumental throughout this project. Um, and that's about all I have. I have a minute for questions.